Today on Between the Lines, what is the one thing that Barbara Streisand, Cary Grant, Clint Eastwood, Paul Newman, and a few hundred other legendary stars have in common? They were, and many still are, clients of my guest, Dick Gutman. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Dick Gutman is the renowned press agent who represents many of Hollywood's A-list superstars. Now with his book, Star Flacker, he gives us an inside look at how he helps them navigate the treacherous waters of a star-crazed media. I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was you, do need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book, are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. You don't get a chance to really talk about what's real. And that is the first thing to do. Dick, it is such a pleasure to have you here. This is, as I, I told all the, the crew, my family, there is no man on the planet who has represented the legends like you do. And to have you here with your book is just such an honor. Thank you, sir. Well, the honor is all mine. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. Let's tell everybody the name, Star Flacker. A flack, as you describe, is a press agent. Yes. And that's what you are. You are a press agent. But because everyone, as I say in the introduction, from Barbara Streisand to Clint Eastwood to Cary Grant, Paul Newman, the Douglases, Kirk, Mike, and even the other Mike yeah. Douglas, you've represented them as a press agent and so many more in between that you decided this is what I would call it. Your daughter, I believe, gave it its nickname. You were not just a press agent, you were the star flacker. Well, I was going to call it it's legends and superstars. And I, my daughter asked what is she, my daughter Monica is a journalist. <clears throat> and <clears throat> she said, oh, th that's pretty boring. And said, it's not only true. She said, the anecdotes are about these people, but the book is about a strange profession that nobody understands, including most of the people in the profession. And I said, what do you say? And she said, I always said that you're a star flacker. Well, you know, this is funny because every anecdote in here is true. It really did happen. Yeah. And I want to describe this because it's part memoir, and in a very weird way, it's a tell-all book, but not in the negative sense of a tell-all. What it really is, it's a tell-all of the value and the importance of not only what the agent does, but what the stars really mean, and what they do, and what movies and film really mean. And it's also a guide, as you say, to the profession itself, which is basically a guide to skillful persuasion. That's exactly it. But it's something that, that it pertains to everybody. I think people, the rules in it will apply as much to somebody who's uh, selling machine tools as it applies to a press agent or somebody who's uh, a salesperson or somebody who's a lawyer. You have to persuade. Our life is always persuasion. Our life also does something that you sum up, and you use it, in, again, in the business of Hollywood, but I think, it, like you said, has universal appeal, and that is there's a winding road leading, these are your exact words, to almost every association in, you say, the business, but mm -hmm. the truth is in business and life. Absolutely. It's a winding road. Yeah, and when you look back, you're bewildered that fate took you in those directions. I mean, I'm, I'm just astounded by, my, my fate was always written by my selection of profession. Publicity took me to the places where I had to be. And you were mentored by the man who literally invented this yep. concept, Warren Cowan, and his most famous words, and they still ring true, is get the hell out of the shot. That's right. your most important job. But what you did was, besides getting out of the shot, you knew that you really wanted to, rather than be this part of a big conglomerate, which was what Rogers and Cowan was becoming, right. you wanted this boutique known as Gutman Pam at the time and now right. Gutman Associates. But in a weird way, that boutique became very close to being a large conglomerate because right. everyone wanted to work with you. 
well, at a certain point, we did become. I, we, we had probably 20 staff. It was it bewildered me, and I was really unhappy because I'm definitely not an executive, and I'm a good press agent. And I got then my wife arranged the dissolution of that company, and uh, and and told Warren Cowan, who wanted to partner with me thereafter, she said, look, he's going to have one partner the rest of his life, and you're looking at her. <laughs> oh, and so at gosh. that point, we became the boutique I wanted to be. Well, I want to talk about her, because Gisela, that's her name? Gisela. 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 Oh, say it again. Gi. Gisela. Gisela. Mm -hmm. Ah, isn't that funny? Without a pronunciation key, mm -hmm. I couldn't get it. Gisela. She plays such a major role in this book, and she really... Well, you know, she captures your heart and you capture hers, and a lot of it has to do with laughter. As you even say, laughter should be written into the wedding vows. Should be. It's much more, it's the best thing we can bring into it. We've never had an argument that, oh, we've had some that didn't resolve, but we've never had one that we couldn't somehow find. Either I make her laugh or I make her make me laugh. Because I know that she's going to re respond in a great way. Oh, and throughout the book, you see how she, she comes to the rescue all the time. She's there for you all the time. I, I'm blessed also with a woman in my life, my wife, who, who does the same thing. And laughter is, again, a key to it, that ability to laugh with your life partner. And I, I don't know if there's a greater joy that one could hope for. I think... I, I've tried in my life to be a purveyor of laughter. I, I've kept clients for a long time. You know, a lot of our people are 40 years, 50 years, 60 years I've handled them. And, uh, and a lot of it is because we were always laughing together. Oh. And, and it's not hard. There were, you know, great wits. But I've, I mean, what, what I want to do with this book is to make people laugh. I think whatever knowledge it conveys, that's great. But the, I guarantee you there's two or three laughs on every page. Oh, I, I'll tell you, that's what made me, all I could do was share the stories with my family, and we would mm -hmm. just be sitting there either in awe, because a lot of it is just amazing. I want people to, I mean, there are stories here that, and as I said, it's not tell all. It's not like you're going to find out. In fact, it's the opposite. You're going to find out about Barbara Streisand, but you're going to find out how wonderful, how smart, how charming, and how witty she is. That's hey, what you. Streisand. Sand is on a beach. Oh, my gosh. Look, at first your wife, now this. My wife's going to kill me because I bad enough I have the New York accent, Dick. But I want to give the rules, somewhat of the guidelines, uh -huh. as you say, because this is the one that literally sparked your soul when you knew that you had this as a concept. A problem is an opportunity in disguise. Turn a problem inside out, and it is the solution. It's never failed me. It's never failed me. In fact, sometimes when I'm, I don't know how to proceed on something, I try to find the problem in it. You almost not only don't look at it as a problem, you say embrace it. Embrace it. And, I mean, make love to it practically. Right, right. How's that going to be benefit me? What, what doors does this open for me? Uh, what new thought does it? I had uh, 15 minutes before I was to leave here, my uh, Rona Menashe in my, my office dropped a problem in my lap, and I had to turn my mind closed and just go by instinct where the answer was for that. It was a terrible problem. We came up with a really pretty good answer. But I had to do it in 15 minutes because I didn't want to be late. Well, by the way, time plays a big role in publicity. You have to act very quickly on a number of, of levels. Well, timing is like comedy. I mean, comedy is the answer to comedy is, is timing. And the answer to publicity is that you have, you have to do is identify something that has uh, urgent purpose in in the in the news field, <clears throat> and then if you can, what I did with this thing was a, it was a op-ed that wasn't going to fly, and I gave it a news context, and now it's going to fly. You say one thing: learning from your clients. I think that is such an open, honest thing because when we think of the press agent, we think, and and, and you say this in the nicest way. 
you're really the navigator of the tugboat. They're really the big ship. But yet you also learn so much from them in here. That's, and you share that with everyone. Well, they're really bright people. <clears throat> from Barbara, this is a hard lesson for a press agent to, to learn because the temptation to embroider a story is pretty great and the opportunity is magnificent. And so at the beginning, in the old days, before there was the internet, I used to make up a lot of really interesting stories. And they'd get into print because they were interesting stories. They weren't necessarily true, but they told the truth. And which was, you know, that Paul Newman is the number one guy or whatever the purpose of that story. And uh, Barbara is always insistent that everything, if, 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 if it's a story that uh, enumerates some of her accomplishments, she wants to make sure it's been checked that it still pertains. And that was, that's a really good lesson. Well, yeah, and in fact, you live your, you lived your life by it. The truth is, yeah. like you said, you could make the truth interesting, mm -hmm. but if you take too, too much liberty with the truth, A, it'll damage your client, it'll damage you, and the relationship with the reporters who you're feeding this information yeah. to, with the press, uh, the, the papers themselves. So truth, it, and we don't always think of it that much in Hollywood, but it plays a major role in the way you've conducted your right. business. So you, you know, you can't burn <clears throat> people too many times before you've lost your credibility. And a press agent cannot, lose, cannot squander his, press, his credibility. The one thing you also did with all of your clients, and you really say this over throughout the book, is if you don't believe it, you cannot sell it. Right. You had to believe in every one of your clients' talents, and otherwise you knew that you couldn't help them in any right. way. Well, that was Gene Hack Hackman's lesson to me. <clears throat> he was on location, nobody was happy with the script comes down to breakfast, two of the actors are playing games, giving funny readings to the script for the, the, the dialogue for the day. And they tried to get him into it. And he says, you know, you guys are kidding yourselves. When you say these words, your face is gonna be 20 feet high. You better find something in there that you can believe. And that, that was, was a great lesson in, in acting, but in anything. And Gene Hackman, again, that's what you learned from your clients. Right. When Gene did uh, The Firm with, uh, uh, Tom Cruise and um, you know they're the above the line stars and then it, it said uh, they, they came to him they said well he's um, there's a con uh, an aspect of Tom's contract that he has to be uh, the only star above the title uh, is it all right if you put your name underneath and Gene says don't use my name if you look at the at the one sheets for uh, the firm. His name isn't in the ads. Wow. He, well, Gene is, he truly is one of the, un, even the way you, you handled the conversationist, mm -hmm. uh, the, the uh, wait, am I saying it right? The conversation. Yeah, the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is a brilliant story of publicity because Francis Ford Coppola was directing both that and The Godfather too, and you had to really fight to get that one on because you, you knew how good it was. Well, Paramount was worried. I mean, they, Paramount had been saved by Godfather 1. They were writing a big crest on that. Godfather 2 was coming up, which was very evidently a much better movie. And uh, they were terrified that he would be, that this would siphon off some of the attention. And I know it's just the opposite because uh, when I voted for Diane Keaton for uh, Annie Hall, largely because I thought she was so great in looking for Mr. Goodbar. She didn't get nominated for that. So of course I would take that energy over to this. And that's how it was with Jane. And Paramount had literally done everything they could to bury that movie. They opened this tiny little film that should be in an ADC theater at the Pantages and the Plit, you know, two biggest barns in Hollywood. Even if we filled it with its normal audience, it would look like you know, people had avoided it. And they did everything, it was just, let get that movie out of the way. And then we came up with an idea that actually rescued it, and I was happy. Now you say these words of wisdom again that I think applies to every human being on the planet if they could take this home with them. Don't fixate on your home runs or your strikeouts. Learn from each. Yeah, it's true. 
Well, Coach, you know, you've always already completed that at bat. <laughs> you can't get it back. And so you might as well find what was in there that I can use for the next time. The trick, though, with being a great PR agent is to be literally, like you say, a hitman, to almost be invisible, not only stay out of the shot like Warren right. said, but to make it seem that these things are happening even naturally right. without you guiding them. That balance to me was right. fascinating. Well, it's essential because you're out, in, in fairness to your clients, their fame is re the reflection of their talent and their accomplishment. It's, you're not, it's not because you were able to get a story in the paper. So you have to let that be manifest, that th this is not something that was structured from. This is the natural consequence of how brilliant they are. And well, so that's you, the case. You even say humility is not a PR contradiction. It is an essential. essential. Well, that's when I learned from Jay Leno. I mean, Jay Leno a absolutely avoids anything that will celebrate something uh, that he's accomplished. It's just who he is. And, uh, and it works. And, and if, if you don't have humility, if you accept this, and it's going to look like braggadocio. You say these words, Dick. Integrity comes with a price, but so does the lack of it. That I had in? That's pretty good, actually. Yes, you did. Good job, right? Okay. I, should I be your press agent? Dick? Well, I, I require that. You are. This is so, this <laughs> that's is so true. Great. That's true. But that, that to me, is an, an important thing, is that we, we know how important t integrity is, but it does come with a price. But if we don't, aren't willing to pay that price, you're going to pay the price for the lack of integrity. I think part of the, the, the negative price is your own self-regard. I mean, if you don't have self-regard, what are you doing? Where are you going? I, I don't know if I call it integrity myself, but I, I decided when I was writing this that if I put in one thing that I know to be incorrect, that I will have eradicated any integrity that the book has. There's nothing in there that I know, knowingly made up. I may have forgotten something incorrectly, but probably not. I have a good memory. It seems that way. I want to say this. This was uh, a revelation to me. This was talk about learning from the book. Your words, a question mark is far more powerful than an exclamation mark. Right. Now that rarely enters one's mind. When one, and, and by the way, I could see how even it was pitched the way it was. Mm -hmm. It was pitched as kind of put those exclamation marks and you said, right. no, no, put the question mark. A question mark holds your attention because you have to wonder about it and think about it. Say these words. The first thing you have to understand about publicity, and again, and, and this is why I think this will relate to all life, is that disaster always and forever sits in the corner waiting to pounce. All of us know that no matter how planned we are, no matter what, disaster is waiting in the corner. And the key is how fast can you react to it and how with integrity can you react to it? Or how can you avoid it? Oh, <laughs> he, would that it. not be <laughs> even the best? Is that part of, and that's part of the, the thought process then? Well, you know, in publicity, it's, it's dangerous because what we, what we cause to be uh, uh, in public conscience, consciousness is of interest. And if I mislead them, then I, that the door's closed to me the next time. You could do something that you can't do anything that's going to embarrass your client. And, uh, and I've seen press age, I'm sure I've probably done something that embarrassed a client. If I did, I've successfully repressed that. <laughs> I don't remember it Good at all. Good move. Good move. Yet at the same time, there's, you use the word audacity, and you say audacity makes its own wave. So there has to be a boldness, yeah. even when truth is being told. To be a little audacious, especially in this business, is not a bad thing. Um, actually, I was just dealing with it. The sequel to this book is because I can't do it 600 pages again. That's, nobody's going to print it. But I'm going to do a book of the rules of persuasion. 
And uh, so the other day we were facing something, uh, and I said, instead of look, looking for the small ways we can reach that destination, let's see, look if there's one big thing that we could do at a one fell swoop. I said, because a boulder is much more persuasive than a bunch of rocks. And if the boulder fails, you can always go back to throwing the rocks. Oh, you say also this, and this I think is from the relationship with your clients that you must know this for a fact. Fame isn't the prize, it's the price. Yeah, every actor knows that. Every, everybody who has a claim, it, it's a t heavy toll. Um, you're never, you're ne you never have anonymity. You walk any place. And one of my clients uh, gets through it by never making eye contact because these people have access and you know they've paid, they've created your fame and they've created the acclaim for your films. They have a right to you in a certain way. If they see that they have attracted your eye contact, they move in. And this guy can walk through a crowd and feel that he's alone. And it's, it's very helpful. You say this, PR is a vehicle of propulsion, and in any locomotion, the most important element is the capacity to break. That's, no, it's true. You don't want to set anything in motion that you're not. Oh, the, the best example of that, was Kirk Douglas did a film with um, John Wayne. It was a, the war wagon, I think. It was a time when Westerns weren't doing very well. So there's this terrible story in uh, Luella Parsons' column one day. Uh, John Wayne did something, some, something terrible about Kirk. So I take it to Warren Cowan and uh, I say, you know, we, we should deal with this. And he says, calls the phone, Kirk, we're on the way up. There's something that we have to do with. We have an answer, which we didn't. And uh, we get up there and he shows it to Kirk. And uh, Kirk's reading it and Warren says, oh, we have a very good answer, which we're still trying to think up. And uh, Kirk says, well, answer, no, no, hold on a second. He picks up the phone. Hi, is he there? It's Kirk. Duke, it's Kirk. No, no, I know she didn't say it. She, she knew it was bull when she said it anyway. Here's the thing. You come back and I come back and say, that right wing son of a gun, he can take that and, and, and we'll, we'll have a good feud. And it'll put some wind in the sails of the film. And then he turned to me and he says, a feud is a great thing as long as you control both sides. Oh. Now, Dick, the, one of the things that besides getting the good stuff out is to stop the damage. And you say you always meet damage head on. That's how you control damage. Or even better, you turn the damage to your client's advantage. Well, uh, damage or negative has energy. Anything that's negative has energy. Anything that's positive isn't so very interesting. And so there's always some way to to twist that. I mean, in, in most situations, I'll, I'll respond. If I respond at all, I usually don't respond to the, uh, to the tabloids at all because they're just going to use my having spoken about it to validate it. And, but usually I, I will just simply not be available for comment. So they can't even say they declined to comment <laughs> because oh. it's going to be gone. I mean, so, so many of these stories, you read them and you know that it's one of my clients uh, was very concerned about a story that it really sort of reflected badly on his appeal to the other sex. And, um, and he says, can this hurt me? I said, you know, I would think it would hurt me, except that the, it hurt you, except that the cover on that particular issue was, is AIDS destroying the vampire population of Europe? I said, that's what, <laughs> what are you worried about here? <laughs> oh, gosh. Dick, you said also that what, when you want to take an opportunity, you don't only just want to take the opportunity, you want to try to put a creative effort into that opportunity so that it really almost adds two to three additional yeah. opportunities. Well, it's a, That's a tricky thing. You know, well, it, you have to find out how the story can play out. It's a good story. If you go one break, that's pretty quickly forgotten, but if it continues, it'll make an impression. 
can't believe it. I wanted to talk to you for forever, Dick, but our, our time is up, believe it or not. I'm going to have to end with this. I'm so sorry. I, I'll have to wait for the sequel. I can't sequel. I just can't <laughs> believe it's over. You have to be crazy to write a memoir, and you don't find that out until you're halfway through. Thank you, Dick, for being crazy enough to share your life with us today. Oh, that was my supreme pleasure. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. And thank you all for joining us. Now, before Dick leaves, I'd like to leave you with these few more words from Star Flacker. It's fine to practice the same arts and devices everyone else does. It's more than fine. It's imperative. But to have any kind of momentary edge, you have to keep coming up with new modes of advantage. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between the familiar practices and all the new modes, remain ethical and you will always have the edge. Thank you so much, Mr. Oh, Bettman. Thank you. Oh, oh, it's gosh. my pleasure. Oh, how wonderful that was. Closed captioning for Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible by your generous contributions to KLCS Education Foundation. Thank you for your support. To connect with Barry, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, watch past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com. <laughs>